Hi, and welcome to Artcasters. This is the show that we do weekly, um, alternating between myself and Scott Circlin's channel, and uh, with you know a rotating third chair. Um, this week we have uh, Mike Emirates on. So, um, Mike, where can we find your work? Uh, okay, right now, um, probably Instagram at um, Mike Emirates, or I just uh, I just launched my store at spacecatcomics.com, and that actually links to all of my stuff too. Nice, and there's like a lot of awesome prints and stuff on that store, so you guys should check it out. And actually, anybody following my channel who's into like B-movie stuff, um, like the, there's this beautiful B-movie poster style space cat, uh, it's amazing. Um, uh, Scott, um, where can we find your stuff, sir? You can find me right here at <laughs> CircWorks.com. <laughs> and uh, CircWorks on YouTube, CircWorks uh, pretty much everywhere, Instagram, Facebook, all that. Some some places I'm, I frequent more than others, but uh, mostly YouTube. Uh, so, yeah, find me at CircWorks at YouTube or however that works. Just do a search. Nice. Search for CircWorks on the yeah. tube of you. <laughs> All right, um, and then you guys are already on YouTube on my channel, so this is, a, of course, where you, where you would find me, and then you can also find my comic at quarterlystories.com. So um, today we were thinking about talking about just kind of fear in general, and I think it, it kind of got brought up because I've been kind of addressing that on my own vlog um, on a few videos because there was this kind of fear that was holding me back from kind of returning to vlogging um, and kind of corresponding with returning to like doing t-shirts and stuff. Um, just kind of like once you press pause on something, it's really nerve wracking to kind of restart. And then Mike was also talking with us about um, having some of those, those same kind of fears and stuff about like creating his own store. And so we were just like, hey, that, that's a, a great topic. So we thought we'd address just kind of like overcoming fear of, um, you know, kind of, I don't know, it'd be almost like fear of success, I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so do you want to kind of, do you want to tip, uh, tee it off like uh, Mike, like and kind of explain a little bit of like what kind of, what, what happened with the store and how you, how you kind of, eventually got it got the store up with all the prints sure sure yeah i mean I, I think you really uh you hit a good point when you said fear of success because i think that's kind of a big part of it at least for me um not like you feel like you're going to have success but it's that idea of like well if this is successful then what does that mean what what more am i going to have to do how many people are going to see this am i going to be judged you know all that kind of stuff and I, I feel like for the longest time, maybe I wasn't consciously thinking about that stuff, but that was, it, it had to have been a driving factor in the back of my mind because I ordered my prints um, in like the beginning of the summer this year and I was hell bent on opening up that store. And a lot of people had been encouraging me to open it even sooner. Like uh, it was actually last year was my first plan to open the store. I wanted to get it open by Christmas and I just didn't. Um, there was a lot of factors that I was kind of making up to get in my way, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but even once I finally had all that resolved and I, I ordered the prints, I had them physically in my hand, um, for some reason I still just couldn't click that button to, to open up the store. And I've been coming to terms with a lot of that more recently that, you know, it's probably just fear. It's probably just, like you said, a fear of success or maybe even a little bit of a fear of failure. Like, well, what if I post it up there and, and nobody sees it, you know? Which um, Gaz uh, actually said, which uh, you guys all know Gaz. He's been on the show a bunch of times. I was talking to him about this and he said, like, <laughs> he actually made me feel better. And he's like, well, you're right. Like, probably nobody will buy one and and that's that's the reality of it like that's something you should probably come to terms with so that kind of put it in perspective it's like well maybe that's not something to fear then like maybe that's just sort of the norm you know um so then i i had like a new attitude about it like yeah you know what like maybe it's not going to be a, a great big success but at least it'll be open at least it'll be there and um sure enough like i i just up and decided to open it and my my 
best and, and worst expectations kind of all happened at the same time. Like I sold a bunch of prints. I didn't sell as many as I thought that I would, but I also sold more than I think, uh, uh, more than, uh, I don't know how to, how should I put it? Like I sold less than I thought that I would, but I sold more than what would be like considered a, a success for a first launch on a store, you know? So it was like a feel good moment and, and a mix of emotions of like, well, is this good? Is this not good? Like, what is this, you know? And it was like, finally, I guess through having that experience that I was able to get over all of it and just accept like, oh, well, I guess I got a store now. I guess this is what I'm doing. And it wasn't that bad. And I got to learn a bunch of stuff afterwards that I wouldn't have learned had I not opened it. So in a way like conquering that fear made it uh, much more manageable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I was just telling someone else, like whenever you have a fear, it's like the, the fear is based in like this, this unwillingness to change, you know? And I feel like once you've made the change, then suddenly that's the new normal. And it, it starts to level out like just this week was kind of chaotic because I had to I had to figure out how to print my shipping labels and, and organize all that kind of information to get things out to people. I had to figure out how to ship internationally and deal with customs and all that. And, and all of that was stuff that I didn't anticipate. And it was real hectic and stressful and it, it took a lot of time. But once it was done and I got another order the next day and it was like, oh, uh, this information goes into this file and that thing goes into this bin and then that goes here and then I click that and then I leave the package downstairs, boom, like 10 yeah. minutes done, you know? So now that's the new normal and it, it really makes me reflect on that fear is like, you know, okay, so, so that happened and this is how it wound up. What new fears can I then face to come out the other end, you know, slightly more prepared or, you know, able to do more cool things <laughs> yeah i mean i i think um it, it's it's fascinating because a lot of what you're talking about i i feel like <clears throat> um i experience like every once in a while and and i still experience it like i it's it's something i used to get more crippled by when i was like younger and and starting to kind of do things like i remember holding off on submitting to threadless because my designs were good enough and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. or like not approaching a client that I really wanted because I'm like, well, when my portfolio is a little better and like coming up with a million reasons, like, well, they wouldn't want to hire me because they've hired this guy that I really admire, you know, <laughs> like, um, um, and, and yet like, it's funny because I'll, I'll feel like I'm kind of over it. And yet I still kind of have that, even with the gallery 1988 thing that I was working on for, for like the Monty Python print where it's like, when I got invited to that, I was just like, well crap, DK and G's shows there. You know, I'm like, I'm not DK and G like, I'm not a big, like massive known, like poster printer or anything. So even now, like after dropping those off, I'm like, I've already had that fearful picture of the opening day when everybody checks out all these cool posters by people way better known than me, mm -hmm. and then they just pass mine by. Like, oh, that's that's ugly. I like this, you know. Oh, uh, man. It's it's funny because it's like, you know, I don't take it as seriously as I used to, you know. Like, yeah. but um, but it's funny because it doesn't. I, like for me, that doesn't go away because I think there's like this. For me, at least, I, I think um, actually Corey in the chat just put it really well, where he said it's the fear of working, no one caring, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. And I and I kind of don't know if that gets killed. I just think you tackle it enough, and like eventually it starts to kind of get easier because you start figuring out like, well, or or like um, sometimes like question exercises will help you with that too. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it's kind of like, uh, what's it called? Like the law of averages, right? Like if you do something for a long enough period of time, you experience all the different highs and lows. So then oh, yeah. when you have those lows, you're less affected by them because you know you can anticipate some highs still. You know, it's not like your first rejection or something where it's like the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is like, I, I think it's more of like, um, you know, like I think rejection just sucks. Like it's always gonna yeah. suck to get rejected if you're if you're a passionate person about what you're doing. 
And if you're making anything worthwhile, you're going to be passionate about it. So, you know what I mean? So inevitably, people making things they're passionate about, it's going to suck to like be like, here's the thing I'm really passionate about. Like, check it out and have like one like or <laughs> one share or one purchase. You know, it, it always mm -hmm. kind of sucks. But, but the, like the thing that helps me, I don't know, we got to get Scott in on this too because I know Scott, I'm sure you've experienced this kind of thing too. But um, the, uh, the thing that always helps me with that, like one of the tricks that I was talking about with the question exercise is I'll, um, I'll ask myself just to like kind of try to follow my fears to their logical conclusion. Mm. So it's like if, if my fear is like, for instance, um, if it were opening a store or something, I'd be like, so what's the worst that happens? Well, no print sell. And then just ask myself, where am I at now? Like, yeah. you know, well, I'm at a point where no prints are selling because I don't have a store, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so my worst <laughs> Even if you sell already it, here. It better. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And, and, I, and I did this with the Gallery 1988 thing because, like, I had to sit down and do it. And I was like, I had this moment, like, you know, that little, like, panic moment, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I really love Monty Python. I really, like admire a lot of the people who've shown at this gallery. I have no idea why the gallery is okay with me being there, all of that stuff. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And then I just finally had to ask myself, okay, so what's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is like I submit something that they then reject. And then I'm not in a gallery 1988 show. Best case scenario, I end up in the show. So worst case scenario is already here because I'm not in a gallery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like I'm already living in that existence. Existence. So, like, really, the worst thing that could happen is not that bad. It, it's like trying to kind of present, the, whereas, like, really rational fear, like, it's a good fear to, like, get your brain in gear to figure out how to make things work, you know? Because mm -hmm. we're kind of problem solving when we're making art, right? Oh, yeah. Um, but, it, but it's not like a rational fear, like, like you know an earthquake or something you know where it's like an earthquake what's the worst case scenario like you could die you know like it's a massive <laughs> yeah. like the risks are, are huge and so there's actual instinctual fear that's that's probably healthy you know but um but like it, it is funny because i think as artists at least for me there have been points in in you know in my life and they kind of like you were saying it's like they'll kind of come in waves, you know? Mm -hmm. But there are points where you'll just get so crippled by the fear you'd almost think it was an earthquake, you know? Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's so weird because, it, like I said, I think it prevents us from doing things like, like you know, like opening your store where it's like, hey, some prints sold, you know? That's yeah. awesome. Like, it, it, honestly, if one person bought the print, you know, you're doing better oh, yeah. than a lot. It would have been a great store. day, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of online stores that, you know, people put up and who knows what they, what they sell, you know, what they're buying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I It's don't know. so strange because it's like fear isn't rational, you know, and, yeah. and, and you can't, you can't really grasp that until after you've gotten through it though. And that, that's the strangest part, I think. And I think a lot of that, a lot of what it takes to get through fear is like faith, honestly. And it doesn't have to be like a spiritual kind of faith, but, you know, faith in yourself, faith that it's not as bad as it seems. And that can be so hard because that's like asking you to, uh, to, to kind of break apart your reality a little bit because right now the reality is like that this thing is like life and death, that, you know, the, 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 the tension, the anxiety that's coming from it is like that it's, it's a danger thing to avoid, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you have to really trick yourself into, uh, into recognizing that that's not the case and to go towards it, not away from it. Well, and also acknowledging it is like, you know, it's like, like any mental issue or whatever hat, like the first step is just like being like, wait a second, this is fear. You mm -hmm. know, Cause that, yeah. Cause yeah. that's the tricky thing about that kind of thing. Um, cause to me, I think that's one of our, at least, for me as a creative, I, I, I think most creatives I know, that's usually their biggest enemy is themselves. Oh, like, yeah. because of the, like, subconscious thoughts that happen when you're doing, when you're building something. Because it's always, like, the second you start building something, there's always that fear that somebody, like, it's, it's almost like 
maybe it starts in preschool or something, <laughs> you know, you're stacking like little letter blocks and you're just waiting for that like other little toddler to come by and just knock over your blocks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like, I think that's like kind of what we're doing. We're like, we're, we're stacking, we're like stacking bricks and we're afraid somebody's going to come by and like knock over the wall. And, um, yeah, but it's, but it's, it's funny because I, I, at least for me, like for instance, when I stopped vlogging for a little bit, for a long time, I just had all these reasons, like, tons of reasons that I told myself like why oh I'll do it next week because blah 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 or I'm gonna edit and make it perfect and that's when I'll get back to it you know mm -hmm. and at the end of the day it was all just kind of excuses because what I needed to do was just do it or not you know <laughs> um, but it's but it is funny because it took me probably because I, I think I stopped for like four or five months maybe six months and and it literally started as like about two months of just like not even thinking about like what was behind stopping, like continuing to stop, you know? Yeah. It's interesting when you acknowledge that it's fear because then you're like, oh, okay. Like at least then you know your enemy a little bit. Yeah. I don't I know. know. I know for me, I was like, I was disguising the fear as like dozens of excuses, you know? And, and that's kind of what started setting off the warning signs was when I would talk to other people, especially people that had been through what I was trying to do before, you know, like that had opened a store and probably had it for years. And, you know, hearing from those people, it was like I would give an excuse and it would be, OK, we'll do this then. And then I would give another excuse and it'd be, well, why not try that? And then given another excuse and it'd be like, okay, just go to this website or whatever. And it was like the solutions were so easy that it suddenly became obvious to me that I was really procrastinating. And then I had to ask like, well, why, why are you procrastinating? You know, what's, yeah. what's the real deal going on here? You know? Yeah. And when it was, when I recognized that this was fear and I don't even know what kind of fear at this point, like, I think, I think, in some ways, like I said earlier, maybe a fear of success. Like, well, if it does well, then what? You know, can I handle that? <laughs> can, is yeah. that like, an, is the amount of work that I'm going to have to do in addition to what I already do? Is that something that I can do? And if it if it really isn't, like objectively, if it isn't, then why am I trying to do this thing in the first place? You know, but if it is, then the opposite of that. Why am I not? Why am I not just opening it up and and going for it? Yeah, I think. Um... That that touches on a on a really interesting thing because like the so the adverse of like what I was talking about where a lot of the fears are like based on on like kind of like the consequence of failure isn't much worse than usually where you are mm. like <clears throat> like I I'm, you know I remember even out of art school I was one of the first students I knew who'd like freelance and then I had a lot of buddies who had just graduated who just wouldn't approach clients and you know they were and they always had that like well when my portfolio is ready and you know when when everything's lined up and stuff and I remember like them a lot of friends of mine like from school um, that like you know it took them years to finally get into the professional world of art because they were just making these excuses and I think behind it was like this fear of actually just getting in the game because you know the rejection but I think like I said because the consequence of that doesn't really put you in a different position than you are already um, it's the success that I think I think you're right because I think the success is like super um, dangerous seeming you know yeah oh definitely and I, I think because success can actually have much weightier consequences like you know yeah. then you have responsibility. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. Responsibility. You have to kind of uh, put your put your skills where your mouth is, so to speak, and yeah. keep up with the thing that you were trying to get. And and yeah, that can be even scarier too. And I I've I feel like there's a it's easy to get trapped in in that kind of loop as well because maybe and I'm not, this isn't about anybody specific or even myself, I could relate to it in some points in my life, but you know, maybe it's not the fear of success in the sense of uh, like an, um, uh, 
you know, wow, I'm at such a loss for words tonight. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is maybe it's not the fear of success in that you could handle it, but are being self-conscious and holding yourself back. Maybe it's that you know that you couldn't handle it. And so rather than accepting that that's not something that's going to happen, you fall into this kind of perpetual procrastination. You know what I mean? There's always a new thing that's got to be done before it'll be ready, that kind of thing. I see yeah. I've seen that a lot, and I can relate to that at certain points in my life too, especially when, uh, oh God, I could go down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but just a quick little aside, like I was pursuing game design for a long time, and like I was getting some little jobs doing like concept art and uh, some level design kind of stuff, a little bit of 3D modeling and whatnot, textures, but like the actual designing, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do, you know, the little things, I wanted to do the whole thing. So. I was trying to design my own games for years and I, I taught myself programming. I taught myself, you know, d audio, everything that I could possibly learn in order to make the entire game like by myself. And I was going so against my grain, but for whatever reason, I had the blinders on and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't acknowledging it. And so rather than accepting that and understanding like, Hey man, this isn't going to happen. Like, I painted that picture as something else. I painted it as, well, I still have to do this. And, and once this is done, then it'll be ready. But it was never ready, you know? And I feel yeah. like that's a different kind of fear, but it could it could easily fall into that same category where it's like, you're not acknowledging that it's fear. And, and, then, and not only that, but acknowledge exactly what you're afraid about, you know? Because the mind plays tricks, at least in my experience. I've, I've seen that the mind can really play some tricks on you sometimes, you know? And, uh, well, especially when you're delving into the world of making stuff with your mind, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, I think why it's such a, um, like, I don't think it's unique to only like illustrators and cartoonists and designers and stuff. I, th I think it's pretty much anybody taking on a creative endeavor where you're conceptually, conceptually coming up with something, you know, mm -hmm. because the execution, like, you know, to, to have a concept, like that's a big part of art. So like the concept in that case would be like, I'm going to be a game designer, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the execution of that concept is where it gets really tough. And, and like, and also like, once again, like, you know, um, sometimes maybe that's not the right thing to kind of like a comic. Like if you're going to take on a comic, that's as long as like the one I'm working on or like Scott's working on, mm -hmm. or Mike, you're, you're about to kind of delve into, you know, yep. <laughs> um, it's like the, you, you really need to be sure, like at least somewhat sure, like at, at least more sure than not sure that that's something you want to really create as a reality because it's yeah. like the massive time suck. Absolutely. Um, so like, you know, cause I, I think I know what you're talking about. The other kind of fear, I, th I think I've brought this up on other things, but I remember at junior college um, when I was pretty young, like I, I knew this guy who was, at the time I thought he was this amazing um, cartoonist and he was really skilled. And, um, and he was always working on this like crazy sci-fi story, like um, Tolkien level kind mm -hmm. of writer. And I met a couple guys like this. Like it, I think it was a '90s thing. I don't know. A lot of them like dressed like they were out of Clerks, the movie. <laughs> um, you know, and and like for some reason, like they he'd have like just notebooks full of this world that he was building and stuff. And I remember um, after kind of knowing him for a while, it turns out he'd been working on crafting and building this this world for like ten years. He was like, you know, this is a guy who's in his 40, like mid 40s at a JC, and he had gone there for over 10 years and to a JC, and had this fantasy about like, <clears throat> like I'll get my BFA in illustration, and it was like this world he had built a, about the conclusion that he'd get to, but but he was so busy like world building that it was almost like playing role playing, not actually yeah. crafting stories. You know what I mean? And I think there's a fine line because you can get lost in that, like in all the, the finite details of something. And I think there's a comfort to that for a lot of people, yep. you know, 
um, where it's like you can get lost in all these finite details to the point where you lose track of the game entirely. Or, and, and, and part of it might just be avoidance of like, like man, that's tough, because if you actually write that novel, and then a couple people say it suck. Oh, yeah. It sucks, you know? Like, and actually, if you write the novel, then you're actually presenting it so that, you know, people will act, like, inevitably, somebody's going to say it sucks, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then that's um, a lot of time that you spent. And Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, it's tough, because, like, I, I mean, I'll say there are consequences to making, like, even posting pages of quarterly stories. I had some smart ass on Twitter like talk about how <clears throat> I don't know they they for some reason commented something about um like my writing being really obvious and how I should change my writing. Wow. And I was like do you know how long that page took <laughs> to get? <laughs> and aside from the fact that like I didn't really agree with them and not out of delusion but the point being like when you read some like you know, and I'm not even at the level of like, um, like somebody who's like a massive YouTube star or something who's probably getting like hate all the time in the comments. But it never feels good to do that, you know, like um, to get that. But but at the same time, that's the cost of playing, you know, because like inevitably, not everybody's gonna like your stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you may that that I think that might also be the other thing with that other kind of fear you were talking about, where it's like you yourself may not even like the product, and then you might have to like up your skills or whatever, you know, because you maybe your story comes out like crap, and you're like, wow, all that world building didn't really make my story any better, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Now I actually have to like start crafting my writing skills and. Um, or sit down and like relearn how to draw. I mean, like we've all kind of had to had to do that. Scott, have you yes. ever had that like kind of thing where you like like has there been a time in your like art career where like fear just like totally crippled you or delayed you and like getting somewhere you should have been a little earlier? Or? Definitely, definitely delayed. I don't know so much about like crippling. I've never had that yeah. that I can remember. I mean, maybe it's happened especially earlier on. Um, I mean, I used to get, I used to, when I used to have to make cold calls, <laughs> that may have been crippling, <laughs> but um, I haven't done that in a long time. But yeah, it's, for me, it's, it's weird because like certain things, like it seems like starting something like, like what Mike just went through as far as launching his products and everything, putting that website up there. To me, that's not the hard part. It's like, I get that stuff out there and we, we can go back to this too because you touched on a little bit about putting things out there and them not selling and everything. But so I put my stuff out there, but then but really that's that's only the first part of it because once it's out there, you've got to let people know about it and you've got to promote it. And that's where I fall short because to me it's like, oh man, I got I got my artwork out there, I got a new website, and uh, and then I just kind of let it be half the time and it just sits there because and no one knows about it where I really need to start promoting it same thing with like you know Etsy if I was to run Etsy ads and everything um, that would help me out a lot I mean uh, and that's picked up just because it's holiday season my Etsy stuff but um, and even the store and store a little bit um, but that stuff just takes time for people to get to find and everything and I you know I mentioned stuff like that on my YouTube channel and I guess if I you mentioned that enough that's part of the promotion but sometimes you know you have to do like the paid promotion so uh, when I launched that Cirque Pop store I had that you know I had the design the with the Han Solo and Carbonite flipping the bird and everything um, so my what I wanted to do was I wanted to run ads on that and and I had been waiting because you know it's holiday season I got all kinds of other stuff and I'm going then finally I said you know what I need to I need to run an ad on this so so I I, I was going to run a Facebook ad and I go through and then I'm looking through their terms of service and it says you know anything that can be offensive and I'm like okay I'm trying to think is that offensive what's going to happen if I post it and everything and then uh, and then so I go through their terms and there there is there's just an example like that that shows like a girl flipping the bird and saying offensive and there's it's really weird because I the other thing I noticed is that even if you obviously you can't use foul language but even if you put like 
Kubert language, like the little asterisk. I don't know what the technical term for that is, but you know what I'm talking about with the asterisk and the exclamation points and all that. And instead of uh, like a curse word, you can't do that either. That's against their terms of service. <laughs> so, yeah, Wolverine speech? Is that what it's called, Wolverine speech? <laughs> That's what I associate it with. I always say Kubert. That was the first comic where I saw the asterisk and then the dollar sign, dollar sign. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I just said Kubert because when he popped up, he had that weird language and it would pop that thing up. But yeah, it's, so yeah, that's against their terms of service. So like I, I finally go, you know, I'm going to launch this. And I was, you know, I knew, I knew it was, I knew it, I might run into problems, but I was like, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. And then I saw that and I'm like, well, yeah, I can't do that. So, um, and then I didn't do anything where I could, I could still probably put it as a post. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, if I put it as a post, and half the times when you post something, it's like, boost this post. And then then I, then I, at least I could say, hey, I just put it up as a post. You're the one that told me to boost it, Facebook. You can't, yeah. even though I'm not actually talking to Facebook because it's just, you know, <laughs> the computer or whatever. But um, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, so I, I, it's possible I could just post it natively and and – People might share it and people might find it, but so now I think my my and then I thought, well, maybe I'll just put one of my other designs up, but I think that one's really the one that you know I, I get I get a lot of sales on the uh, at least through Redbubble and some other of those sites, not so much on mine yet, but the, I've got a design with Admiral Akbar and it says it's a trap and he's promoting Admiral Akbar's brand mouse traps or whatever or wolf rat traps or whatever you want to call them. Um, so. That one sells pretty well. So then I thought, well, maybe I'll just run an ad on that. If they go to the store, maybe they'll see the other one. Um, and then I just didn't do it. So, but at some point, I really gotta, you know, I, I, I gotta start trying to promote that stuff. And that that Facebook advertising is a whole other, you know, uh, problem because it's, you know, you, I've heard people that are successful with it, but most people say you just have to play around with it and you have to get a hang of it, and and that you're gonna lose money at first and so I don't know, but at some point I want to set some money aside where I can just do that, you know, and just, yeah. and you know, like, like we're talking about now, just take a risk, you know, it may cost me a little money, but I, I think if I can, if I can drive enough people, you know, just sometimes maybe if they don't even buy, but if, maybe if they go to the website and they're aware that it exists, maybe they come back later or something like that. But it's just like, it's just like certain products, you're not actually trying to, you're just trying to get the name out, you know? Yeah. So so a lot of it's that i mean for me i i like i like i don't really have that fear of like launching a new product it's just following up and it's the same thing with like like my etsy store like i get the stuff out there and then it's like well so people are buying my stuff on etsy and what i really need to do and i i was doing that but now just with the holidays i get busy but I need to res afterwards, you know, I wait, usually wait a week or whatever for them to get the product, write them back saying, uh, you know, give them a coupon code for X amount off their next order or whatever. Say, thank you, please. You know, if you like the item, leave a, you know, leave some feedback, that type of thing following up because it's way easier to get return customers than it is to get brand new customers. So the people that have bought, I really need to reach out to them and, and, you know, give them a reason to, you know, come back. And, yeah. you know, and I can still kind of do that. I think, I think it, the oldest thing that somebody purchased that I haven't responded to is maybe been a month and that's probably not too, too long to go back and, you know, and say, you know, your recent order, here's a, you know, here's a discount or whatever. Um, but yeah, I just, I haven't done that. And I was trying to keep on top of that, but it's like, I like launching new things like, I'll launch the Etsy thing and then I'll launch this other store and then I'll start doing digital products. And, um, but that's only half the, half the battle to quote GI Joe. I mean, you've got to, I mean, you've got to follow up on that stuff. I mean, it, it getting it out there is one thing, but you gotta, you gotta keep on it and make sure that what you have out there, people are seeing and, um, you know, I don't know. It's, so that's kind of my issue, or at least one of my issues, but I, I think every artist has, has kind of those fears when launching things and um i don't you know when i first and it kind of like my this is mike's first time kind of launching that store but i've launched enough of them to know that when i launch a store it, it's like 
blah. It's like nothing, nothing happens. It's crickets. But, <laughs> but gradually through either me hyping it up on YouTube or whatever, or, or just being out there long enough where people start to do search. And of course I do all, and hopefully you're doing the same thing with, and, and you, is yours a store envy store? Yeah, Mike? that's a store envy. Yeah, store, store envy doesn't let you do a lot of um, like keywords and things, but you know, use whatever they'll let you use. But um, I find I get more, na you know, more traffic from Etsy that I'm not like actually bringing to because I don't really point people to Etsy, but people find it more on Etsy than they do hmm. um, on my store envy site. Um, and I know store has got that marketplace and I've yet to, I mean, that's a, th that's a thing. If I, if I sat down and really tried to get it, get stuff featured on that marketplace or however you do that, I don't know, but there's so many of those things. That's another thing. It's the sites up there, but there's people selling on that marketplace on store envy. Um, and I'm not doing it because I, I haven't made the effort to do so, you know? Yeah. So, you know, but I kind of lost my train of thought, I think. But, uh, We're afraid of the marketplace. That's what it was. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, just I guess I put all that stuff out there with the keywords and everything, and people start to find it and everything. And then, but oh, yeah, that's what I was getting at. When I first put stuff out there, I mean, it's not, it's crickets. But then gradually, and, and hopefully the same will happen with you, Mike. And the fact that you've got a few orders already, um, that's a good thing. And I think that's more just because you're always online. You're always, you're involved in the community and you have people out there that know you from that want to buy your art. And I think that's kind of what helps, but to get people that maybe don't know you or, and that might be hard with something like space cat, cause it's so specific to kind of what you do. Um, yeah. although it does kind of have that, it does have that homage angle to like the planet nine and everything. Yeah. Um, or I plan nine. Post plan in nine. some of those groups too, but I didn't get much of a response. Yeah, it, it's it it's difficult, but but yeah. Um, so, but it does eventually. It, it starts to you know you start to get a little sale here and there, and it's like that's been the case with everything. Now, there are people out there. If you have if you have a big audience or whatever, um, you could launch a store and like immediately start selling stuff if if you've got that audience. I don't have that yet, but mm -hmm. but I've got. You know, I've been, I've had those stores out there long enough where they, they, I do start to get sales from. So, um, and in the meantime, I mean, that's one thing I, I do keep on top of is still more or less trying to build that audience. And it's mostly just on YouTube. I make sure I always try to post a video every week and, and keep that up no matter what. And um, that's part of it. But I need to, you know, I need to focus on the other, you know, Instagram, I, I, I'm getting lax on Instagram. I haven't posted anything a long time on that either. So, or Facebook or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's like all this different stuff. Like, what do you do? It's just so much, but yeah. Um, so it's, for me, it's promotion. That's the, it's the, the hard thing to kind of pull the trigger on and get that going. It's interesting to hear that. Cause like I, that just brought to mind, like, so one of my recent fears that I just kind of overcame and I didn't even realize, well, I don't even know if it's fear or just kind of stupidity and stubbornness. Cause I also have that. <laughs> but, um, for me, like I, I, um, I, uh, like on Instagram for some reason, cause I'm like way late in the game on Instagram. So I think I started Instagram like what, like not even a year ago, um, which is like, really late to the Instagram train. But um, for some reason when I was posting on there, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna only post current work, you know? And so I think it was about like two months ago or something where I was kind of frustrated because I'm seeing this really slow growth with my Instagram. Like it kind of went really fast and then it's just been kind of stagnant. And I was like, well, where's like my, you know, my crowd from like my designs that I had all over the internet and stuff. And then I was like, wait a minute, I haven't been posting any of those on there. And I had thought about doing that before and was just like, the thing that prevented me was like, well, yeah, but I really want this to be only targeted to like the stuff I'm doing now and quarterly stories, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then it just dawned on me like, that's really stupid. <laughs> like, like I have some pretty popular shirt designs that I can just start posting and I have enough to where I could post like one a week and it would 
fill up like 10 years, you know, well, not 10 years, but like probably about five or six years if I did one, one a week. And so, um, and I was like, that doesn't have to interrupt the rest of the other stuff I'm posting on Instagram. Like, it's just something I need to schedule. So I was like, <clears throat> this is like four weeks ago. I finally on my Instagram just started posting like a classic shirt design I did. Like, I'm going to try to do it every Monday. But it's like, I don't know why I didn't do that. It's I don't know if that'll lead to a boost, but it's like one of those things of like, the I don't know if it was fear, but I mean, it does seem like it might have been because it's like, well, worst case scenario is nobody cares mm -hmm. and the Instagram stays stagnant. But the best case scenario is maybe I actually pull some of that audience that I had like back on a new platform, you know? Yeah. yeah. I have that same, that same, uh, issue with Instagram. Like, like, cause I, like when I launched that surf pop thing, like, um, it's like, do I really want to start showing like the fan art stuff on here? Do I want, cause you know, I'm like, well, I want to keep it more to the mad science theme stuff. And so I'm just like, and I still haven't decided whether I want to do that. Like what I started doing a little bit is um, I'll put like little, like I hate to say, hesitate to say watermarks because I don't technically like the idea of watermarks because, you know, a lot of times that just means like, you know, putting this big thing over your image so no one can steal it. But just like a little logo at the bottom, like, like I've got, I do a couple, like if I post something that's like young, young and the dead, it'll have a little young and the dead logo. Or if I post, you know, just something general, say, you know, it'll say Cirque works. Or if it says, you know, if it's a Cirque pop thing, I put Cirque pop. And I don't know, that may be like super confusing to people, but uh, in my mind, maybe it's like, oh, okay, this is part of this sort of series to kind of sort that stuff out. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, but I'm, it's kind of my way easing into maybe starting to post other stuff on my, uh, you know, I even thought of like, well, maybe I should start a whole surf pop Instagram, but then I'm like, it took me so long just to build what little following I have on Instagram as it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to start an all new one, you know? So yeah, I don't know. I'm still, I'm, I'm still debating like how to, how to go about that. I like the logo idea. I think that's probably smarter than my nutty one. Like it's, it's like I just I keep, I keep like I, I I don't know if this is good or bad. I think it's part of my personality. Like if you guys follow my YouTube channel, you'll know this too. It's like I'm kind of all over the place. So I have trouble if I just were to like make my channel be like I'm like like branded too much. I have to show, like, for some reason, I want to show, like, playing rock and roll, and I want to show, like, trips. I want to do vloggy stuff, you know? Yeah. And so it's it's not always going to be the most consistent thing on my channel. And it's the same with my Instagram. It's like, hey, here's, you know, my progress on my comic, which is kind of for people, and it's also kind of for me to just keep myself on task with making this project. But then it's like, at the same time, I'm like, and here's some rock and roll. And it's like, I'll, I, I have noticed, I think that confuses people because I'll have like these bands, like, and actually I've had like bands I really dug like in high school that are like, we're following you now. And then like two days later, like unfollow, <laughs> like, you know, because they're like, oh, this guy's like drawing. He's not doing yeah. rock and roll, you know? And it's, it's like... I don't know if I, I don't know if it's chaotic. Like I, I'd have to ask like um, people who were following me because I can't tell. Like yeah. I don't know if people like it or not. <laughs> I'd like to think that it's it can be personality driven. Like people go to your people, and it's not gonna be for everyone. Like some people just want to go for your comics. Some people might want to just go for the music. But there's I think there's a decent amount of people that just want to see what you're doing, what you're up to. Like mm -hmm. I just uh, like. Will Terry just put out a video about this new weight loss thing he's on. And it was like, it was at least an hour and a half long. And I mean, I usually go there just to hear him talk about art, but he put this up. He said, this is different than what I usually do. And he's like, pretty much spells it out. He says, I, you know, if you don't want to watch this, I perfectly understand, but I just, I, you know, I just going to put this out there because I have a YouTube channel and I listened to the whole thing. And he, I mean, I could, I could stand to lose a few pounds, but I'm not like, you know, <laughs> the what diet he was talking about wasn't anything I was probably going to do, but, but I listened to it just cause you know, I like watching the guy's videos and like hearing him talk. So, um, for that, it's more of a personality thing. Now, some people, 
probably are going to be like, I don't want to, you know, this isn't, I want to just hear about art, which is fine. I mean, same thing with my channel, because I've got somewhat of a variety on my YouTube. I do, you know, product reviews. I do I talk about my comics. And mine's weird because, like, everyone, you know, a lot of the gurus and stuff, they, they tell you when you do an art channel, oh, just, you know, do fan art, and that'll bring in, bring in people. And um, for me, like, my fan art stuff gets probably the least amount of views out of anything that I do. And I don't just do it to try to get, you know, views, but just because usually if I do fan art, it's because some new movie or so. Like, I was doing Stranger Things, and then I just did a Star Wars one because I, I just love that stuff. But but it doesn't really help my channel any, which is weird because everyone says, oh, yeah, you got to do fan art, and then then people might check out your stuff. But, like, if I yeah. put out, a, a, a like, a Young and the Dead update, it'll get more views than my fan art stuff, which is weird, you know? I don't know. And some of that, like, the – I still want to do them because I like it, but I haven't done one in a while. But the Mad Genius Hall of Fame, because that was my way of, of picking sort of a, a mad scientist and doing a sketch of them and, and, you know, working it into the channel. But those didn't get a lot of views either, and those took a lot, a lot of time because I had to do – those I was doing a lot of research behind – you know who the character was and talking about it, but I so really it's, enjoyed those. yeah, and I, I still like doing them. I've, I've got I've got like three or four of them like already recorded. Not not the audio. The hardest, like I said, the hardest part is doing the research. So everything but the the voiceover. I've got the drawing all done and the intros done, but yeah. <laughs> just just doing that research and then putting that all together because those ones take the longest. But but I like them. They're fun. So. But yeah, so anyway, I got a variety channel, but and certain people watch certain videos and, and not other ones. And then there's there's some people that might watch anything I put out, you know? Yeah. So, I think that's I, up a, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh well Mike, like how do you deal with that? Like like with um like do you ever worry that like like you're presenting too like focused of a of a presentation or or that Oh or, yeah. Are, are you kind of like like we're kind of describing where it's just like, ah, everything in the kitchen sink, like whatever. Yeah. Like, cause to yeah. me, like, you know, I, I definitely don't have enough followers on YouTube to be like worried about like losing thousands of subscribers. Cause like, I mean, you right. can see my subscriber count is pretty tiny. So it's like, uh, but, I, but I also, for me, I feel like I want to grow being able to do kind of whatever on this yeah. channel. Cause I don't want to like have to, be the guy who like okay here's my watercolor painting that's of flowers and that's my channel i mm -hmm. paint flowers you know like that <laughs> would bore the shit out of me you know i don't yeah. know what, what how do you feel about it because i i feel like you aren't you don't seem super pigeonholed to like one direction with the way you're presenting you know oh, that's you'll, cool. yeah but anyhow what, what do you think Oh, that's actually a awesome, awesome question. Cause I think that that plays right back into that topic of fear too. Cause like for me, I don't think it's really like, uh, I don't think the conflict is in like, am I painting too broad of a stroke as far as content? Like am I doing exercise stuff or art stuff or music stuff? It's not quite like that, but in the subject matter of my art in general, like, um, for me, it's, I, like this is a huge battle that I've had these last couple of years actually, because when I, uh, I'll give you a little bit of backstory on it. When I first started the 100 Days of Making Comics, like right before I was about to start, I was talking with some people. I think actually I, I was in the group a little bit or maybe I commented on some videos. I forgot exactly how it happened, but I had heard back from, uh, from Kevin, from Scott, maybe Peter, a, a few people that were doing the challenge to change my idea to be more of like a smaller thing. Like instead of working on the big comic that I wanted to start with to try a smaller thing, and the, the situation was that that bigger comic was a much, much, much more dark and gritty and mature themed kind of book. And it's it's something that I've been working on for a long time. It's It's got to get done someday. But instead of doing that, I came up with this really lighthearted, fun and goofy idea that turned into Space Cat. And the the conflict is that that's really gotten some wheels and, and i'm in love with the story I'm, I'm still all in i'm gonna do it but there's this whole other aspect to my art that not many people know about or that are discovering in tiny little bits throughout the years you know so yeah. there's a big part of me that's been like 
in the huge conflict of like, do I even let anyone know that I do anything but like this cute space cat kind of stuff? Or do I do I narrow it, you know? Do I restrict myself and censor myself and, and you know, just do these more like, I guess, family friendly kind of uh, stories like with what space cat is. And um, the solution I came to recently is just, you know, just be myself, just do my thing, you know? And if, if people like what I do, then they're, they're either going to like certain things and not others, or they're going to like everything. But either way, like, I can't like stifle everything that I've, that I want to express because like you were saying, I don't have a big audience either. So for me, yeah. it's like throwing darts at a board and whatever sticks. <laughs> so right now space cat seems to be sticking. Maybe something else will stick. Maybe some will fall out after I keep throwing more, but you know, I feel like I'm at a place where, like you were saying with the question exercise, you know, I, I followed that through, and there was there was no real reason at the end to to fear the outcome. Like, I'm, yeah. I don't have enough followers to really worry about that yet. And the the worst thing that could happen is that I stay at the growth rate that I'm at right now, which, you know, it isn't too bad. I could be bigger, but it's still pretty steady. So I don't think I'm scaring anybody away. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like actually it's funny that you mentioned that that kind of um you're working on something lighthearted and then you have like these really like this really dark, heavy story you want to tell, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like I kinda so like most of my career I've been known for like humor. Like a lot of my shirts are funny and mm -hmm. kind of retro and like very like very cartooning, but not like cartooning like this stuff that I'm usually working on on this channel. That's like all hatchy and stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, and like so it it's like almost like if you got known for like being a sugary cereal or something, and, mm -hmm. and you <laughs> meanwhile are like wanting to cook filet mignon or something, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that's that that's kind of the cool thing about cartoons. Like I I rarely met a cartoonist like even you know a lot of the guys at the like NCS like they're working on like one panel gags for like the New Yorker or or for like you know syndication online and stuff and like a lot of those guys on the side are working on abstract oil paintings or like just yeah. like totally like stuff you wouldn't you know imagine from seeing like a, a simple gag cartoon you know mm -hmm. not that they're simple but you, you get my point it's like I think that's kind of the neat thing. Um, I'd rather be drawing in the chats that uh, I noticed the shirt postings on Instagram, and it was interesting to see another side of an artist that I'm following. That's why I like the music postings too. And, he said, and then they said, I like seeing that artists are not one trick ponies. And I kind of feel the same way. Like, yeah. Mike, when you put like variety, like when, when you were posting, like when you were doing the exercises to kind of like almost like reteach yourself to draw, like yeah. that was awesome. And I like that just as much as like when you post like updates on Space Cat or, you know, just like like when you vlogged about your jogs, you know, like, it's <laughs> yeah. like to me that's all kind of part of the package and, and it makes it more interesting, you know. Um, yeah. But I do kind of wonder because I, I haven't really talked to a lot of people who are kind of like doing one style of vlog where it doesn't change, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I wonder I wonder if that is better. Cause I did like I like one of the art groups I'm in, there's a guy who has like a massive YouTube following in it. Um, not Kevin, like a bigger following than even Kevin's. And um and he was giving advice to us on YouTube and like that was actually one of his pieces of advice. It's like, hey, you know, um, like let's say you're doing a YouTube channel and your YouTube channel, like your most popular videos, like, um, blowing bubbles and then painting when blowing bubbles, right? Whatever it is, like you do like an outlier and that becomes popular. That's what you are. Like that's the channel you should do. Every video should be that. <laughs> I was like, that's great. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I feel like that would be really tough to kind of continue, yeah. you know, where it's just like, Hey, I'm the guy who draws like, you know, happy kids. Or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I could understand that though. Cause like I was doing that stop motion for a while and I shared a lot of development stuff while I was doing that, like before I even started the hundreds and 
that followed me like you wouldn't believe. Like I even got some pretty angry messages from people like on my Facebook after I started doing the hundred days saying like, Hey, just so like literally, Hey, just so you know, <laughs> I only started following you because of this video. And I really hope you're going to do more of that. And if you're not, then I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> it's like, okay, then <laughs> like uh, goodbye, I guess. But to this day, that is, it's like my, my best video. It's got like over a thousand views now, maybe even more. Yeah. And it's just a, it's a little stop motion wing test but that's like way different from all the rest of my videos i have over 400 videos now and i have like maybe three or four stop motion type, yeah. type of videos so yeah it's but you're the strange. stop motion guy you can't do anything. apparently yeah <laughs> but then it's funny because as a person who's a fan especially music like i kind of get it because um i remember like <laughs> like chris cornell released a hip-hop album years ago and it was like one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. Like it's literally one of the worst albums ever recorded. And this is a guy who's like a really talented vocalist at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And yet it was just like, it was a terror to listen to. And I was one of those people who like when, you know, people would mention Chris Cornell, like this pre the recent, you know, occurrence with him, but like, um, you know, people would mention being fans, and I'd be like, but that hip-hop album, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> does that make sense? People never like, forget. <laughs> I, I, I get, and I have listened to it, because it's funny. I mean, it's terror. It's like, it's it's like, um, yeah, it's like the room-level bat, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and it's, and I think it's kind of authentic, which is weird. I mean, it, um, but, but the, the point being, like, I don't know, I mean, maybe, you know, I need to be a better fan of people too and be a little more like, well, you know, if they want to do that, good for that, you know? But I can understand if like, if you're a person who's invested in the art more than the person and then the art changes, you know? And you're like, ah, oh, but I liked that thing, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I don't know. But, I, but once again, it's like, I think if you establish before it gets giant, you know, like I am kind of all over the place with what I do. <clears throat> then and that's actually more supporting of the like actually now I'm realizing like that actually is another reason why I should be posting my t-shirt stuff too because along with doing like really like deep dark auto bio stuff I do light like lighthearted pop culture stuff too you know mm -hmm. I'm not like some indie snob in a room like I like cartoons and I like horror movies you know like I'm kind of I, I think if you establish that early on, like think about Guillermo del Toro, like that guy has such a broad variety of what he does that like nobody's going to be shocked if Guillermo del Toro is like, I'm going to do a children's TV show, you know? And like a bunch of people didn't freak out and go, but you make dark, like twisted things. Like how can you make a kid's show, you know? Yeah, it's yeah like, that's true. But it's, it's, still, it's still monsters, though. So that's the thing. It's like, because yeah. I always try to figure out how can I keep everything sort of in the same, you know, sort of with mad science or whatever. And some of it's I'm kind of like put, trying to, you know, take a square peg and put it in a round hole. But, but I try to make it work, you know. But I think a lot of, you know, Del Toro does all this different stuff. But it's usually, but if you look at like Troll Hunters, it's still... Even though it's a kid's show, it's still got his fingerprints on it, you know? Oh, for sure. And I think, like, that, I think, I mean, you're right. Like, he's, he, but, but I think that kind of thing's inevitably going to happen unless, unless you're making a hip hop album from, like, <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> um, and you had, you know, prior to that, no real connection to hip hop. Um, but, like, you know, I, I think, inevitably your fingerprints are going to be on it you know i would hope if, if what you're doing is like sincere and authentic i think that sincerity will show through and i think del toro you're right his fingerprints are all over it however there are del toro mo movies i wouldn't let my kid near you know mm -hmm. and I, I, like we love what like he loves troll hunters like you know i, I had no problem showing him troll hunters and i'm excited about the second season actually coming out soon did it already come out? It's not the 15th yet, is it? What? Troll Hunters? The second uh, season? 
I don't usually you know, Netflix will alert me if it's something I've been watching. So I finished watching the first season. Um, oh, it's two days, two days from now. Oh, okay. Yeah, Shape of Water's limited release right now. I'm wait. I want to see that too. Oh man. So so I yeah that is interesting though because I think if maybe you diverge too much like you know then it could could appear like you're selling out you know so it's like that is a fine <laughs> fine line but I think Mike like it's it's not like changing medium you know and you're just changing like what the medium is it's like we the the um, stuff that drew people into like what you were doing for stop motion is inevitably going to also be in your art, you know? I, mean, I think so. It definitely has much more of a, like I think when I was doing the stop motion, it has much more of a kind of creepy vibe to it. But I think that's sort of inherent in stop motion anyways. I think the part that's me was more expressed in like the character designs and the animation, which is all kind of more bouncy and, and light and, and lively and stuff. So, which is all my art. I mean, even the dark stuff can't, I can't help but still have that in it. And that's yeah. for better or worse, you know? So even my scariest, scary, you know, dark stuff is still going to have a light side to it. I can't help it. So yeah, it all definitely translates, but it's, uh, it's uncomfortable sometimes to hear uh like sometimes some people will say like oh my kids still get the the space cat song stuck in their head from the the intro to all my videos <laughs> and uh and i love it like i i absolutely love hearing that while at the same time i'm like cringing as i'm working on like tank girl or something like well i don't want their kids to see this one <laughs> but i'm glad they like you know <laughs> space cat and i don't know what to do about that and there is like a real fear there too, for sure, of like branding. Like, should I brand? Should I not brand? Like if I, and then again, the fear of success thing. Like, well, what if, what if one brand is successful and not the other? Like, could I, you know, could I do that? Or am I more of a, I need to do all this kind of guy, you know? And I don't know. It's not a decision I want to make. So I'm just kind of throwing it all together right now and seeing how the cards fall. Yeah. I think that's a well. I, I think maybe it might be one of those things of like, um, if you stifle that for like marketing, you know, mm -hmm. then you're gonna probably end up with inauthentic work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I would almost consider that like that would be almost selling out, you know, because it's yeah. like, um, yeah. So like, I I don't know. I mean, I think. I'm hoping that's the right method, but I always do feel a little bad for like people who maybe are following me on Instagram because they're like invested in the process of like inking or something, and then suddenly it's like here's some rock and roll that you didn't want to watch, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> yeah. But I love that stuff. I mean, um, Eric and Terry Fan are two guys that like they're doing amazing children's books, and like they used to design T-shirts around the same time as me. They were far more successful at it. But they'll post on their Instagram like messing around on like a Moog <laughs> and like I I don't know, I like it. You know, I like being able to see kind of what people are up to. It's nice to see I think that's kind of the joy of social media, right? Because if you just want to follow the work, you'll just go to the artist website and check out yeah. the work, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's it's weird how different people handle their different social media profiles. Cause like I follow like Sean Galloway Cheeks, um and he usually, I don't even think he posts any art on his Instagram. I think it's all just family videos and pictures of his kids and stuff, which is fine. I mean, I don't, I mean, it's, I, no, no offense to his family or anything, but I'd rather really <laughs> see his art. But, but that's what he chooses to do with it. And, you know, he's got, he's probably got tons of followers. So, um, different, yeah, different people use it for different things. But, like, so I, I mean, I do follow you on Instagram, Josh, but I can't remember is, is your Instagram handle, is it Joshua Kimball or is it like probably nothing or what is, what is it? Or it's Joshua Kimball. Yeah. So, so since it is you, it's since you're not using it as a, like a brand other than your personal brand, I mean, you yeah. can put whatever you want. It's not like, it's not like quarterly stories is your Instagram handle and you're posting, you know, your, you know, you, you know, you play you with your band or anything like that. It's, it's you personally. For the most part, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, and and like once again, I, I kind of feel like the the 
like the thing I thought about when I when I was first doing that because there's even fear with that because it's like you know most of what I'm posting even on my vlogs and stuff it's like it's not even finished songs it's just practices you know because we're writing mm -hmm. so it's like you know like the last post I did like the basis doesn't even have the part figured out because it was literally his first practice you know so like there's always this hesitation of like well should I present this because it's not perfect and stuff like that but then I realized like I don't know, like when, when I used to do bands when I was younger, it was like kind of pre-internet, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like we didn't even have the option to watch bands like form and write songs and right. kind of see behind the scenes of practices and stuff, except in like documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, so like for me, I don't know, like I kind of think it's fun to like to put up there and be like, hey, here's where we're at, you know? Um, but then again, I do that with a lot of stuff, and I and it, I do think that might actually account for like some of the more slow growth because it's like I'm not really posting a lot of finished stuff. I'm just like here's, you know, like another black and white, you know, inking thing, and then here's that in pencil, like repetitively. <laughs> so I don't know. It it's it's fascinating to me. I just always wonder if that is better or worse. But I think. Like Mike, much like you were saying, I, I I don't know if there's like really much of another way to do it, you know, yeah. where I feel like motivated to keep doing it. Like cause for you, it's like you should be able to post your Tank Girl and post Space Cat and put them in the same feed. And you know, when Space Cat the comics on a website that's like you know, especially if it's kids only, then just don't post. Your Tank girl thing on that, you know, right? right. Yeah, <laughs> cross contamination. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like I, that. I, I like what uh, what Scott said about you know, if it's on brand, then it's then it might be a problem. But as long yeah. as it's just your name, then it's just you. You know, kind of like if you were to look into. Well, I guess Dr. Seuss is probably a bad example because he did different stuff under that same name. But there's a lot of comic artists that have done, you know work all across the spectrum and never oh, had yeah. a problem with it you know i yeah. think all artists too I, I was always curious why why dr seuss did that because obviously that you know theater geisel was his real name so mm -hmm. why he didn't do like separate like his adult stuff under his real name and maybe his kid stuff under dr seuss but he did everything under dr seuss so you yeah. know well, and Roll Dahl wrote like some really soft yeah. stuff for adults. Yeah. And it was under Roll Dahl. And yep. I mean, you have um, like Jeff, the thing about Jeff Smith, like you, you want your kid reading, reading Razzle. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's like, like Bone is like pretty, like, I mean, you know, it's scholastic. It's like, it's yeah. like pretty accepted, you know, but it's like there's stuff by Jeff Smith you may not want your kid to see, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I think that's just the inevitable part of being a cartoonist. I, but like, that's the other thing is like, if you start building your brand before you're like massive, where it's like, hey, I have these two sides, you know, uh -huh. like Dr. Seuss, like he had been doing like political editorials under Dr. Seuss before the books, you know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, at least he had that in his backing. So hopefully that doesn't throw too many people off. But you know it's funny because there are going to be people inevitably that get attached to you for something and then they freak out. Like one of my favorite clips um, on film is like it's in Don't Look Back when Dylan plays his first electric show, and there's just a bunch of hippies just yelling, pissed off because because he's not a purist folk guitarist anymore. <laughs> um, and it's it's amazing because it's like it's like one of the most punk rock things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like that um that footage because it's like it's funny you're watching this entire auditorium just like start throwing things and getting really pissed off and uh you know like 40 years later like most people wouldn't think that was all that bad of a choice the him going acoustic like going away from acoustic you know um but you know at the time like a bunch of people got pissed off at dylan you know <laughs> I don't know. So if it can happen to Bob Dylan, like I'm sure it could happen to any of us. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think we can quote that, but yeah, they just uh, quoted what Dylan says 
at that show. It's amazing. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> What do you mean you can't quote that? You said worse than that on your channel before. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. So it's coming with fucking loud. I just get worried because they're doing that, like that polling all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. Thing. I don't know how that works because I that I just posted that. the last one. I have to go double check and see if it if it went off. But when I post I, that last video, I posted with the porks. You know, it was just a Star Wars drawing. There's nothing wrong with it at all. There's no music or anything like that, but it got demonetized. So, but sometimes it's weird. Sometimes it'll it'll pop up. It'll say demonetize, and then that goes away. So yeah. they're still trying to figure that out. But I I don't think just dropping one f bomb is is. Oh yeah, I don't I don't really think that'll do be anything. actually. But but it's funny because like, so I had the the um, this panel like as a thumbnail got demonetized because I don't oh, really think they knew what it was. And so I think some algorithm was like, this is really bad. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> oh, like, man. Huh. And I was like, that's not even like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's computers are trying to make the decision. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I always have trouble like monitoring that kind of thing. Like on top is like, I'm still marking, the content as mature for quarterly stories and I'm still not sure if it's like mature but I definitely know I don't want like kids reading it but it wouldn't be rated R you know <laughs> so it's like I'm not really sure how that works but I'm still just marking it as mature because like I don't want you know some guy like having his like five-year-old like read like a suicide story or something you know so I don't know it's it's hard. How do like Mike? Are you with Space Cat? Like, what are, what's the rating going to be? I like, would say probably around teen. I definitely yeah. definitely not lower than that. It's it's not like a. I wouldn't call it a children's story. Yeah, it's got some cute elements to it, but it's also got some. Uh, I wouldn't say like adult themes in like a sexual sense, but maybe some adult themes in like a life sense. You know. Um, in that aspect, so maybe some deep things that might not really resonate with a super young audience, but that a teen might at least start to understand. Yeah, um, violence too, like cartoon violence. I've got some. I got a couple poop jokes, so you know, there's that. Which I yeah. don't know. You can depending on what kind of poop joke. Can get for, a rating. for Young and the Dead, I just I usually say '80s PG. And some people don't know what that is because then then maybe they read it. And this isn't PG, and I'm like, well, you watch an eighty, <laughs> you can watch an eighties uh, show like whatever it is, Goonies or any of those shows, and they're gonna say the same kind of stuff that's in my book. So it's like, yeah, that's actually a good good rating, I think. Yeah, which There's... now would maybe be PG thirteen, but maybe Probably. not. It's well, it's no. just weird, you know. Yeah, it's always hard to know that that kind of system. Some things seem like they're getting more lenient, and others seem like they're getting yeah, more yeah. It's really hard to tell. You know, there's PG movies in the '80s that actually had nudity. You know, yeah, it's like so. it goes straight from G to like NC-17. I don't think they're <laughs> yeah. doing. <it> anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think there's anything too extreme in my book that's going to get a rating higher than than teen. Does it ever kind of like freak you out that? Well, or or just weird you out that like the rating system is like so anti nudity and so pro violence. Yeah, that's <laughs> an American. I'm pretty sure that's an American head. thing. Yeah, you can have somebody's head explode, and it's like yeah. still a PG movie, or it's like good for TV. Well, but well, the weird thing is, and that it, it's, I mean, I I do think that's weird and probably and not right, but I remember as a kid, that was the same thing. Like my dad, there are certain movies that I wanted to see that my my parents wouldn't let me see. And my, you know, my parents had like, I don't know if they had like double VCRs or whatever, but what they would do is they would, they, they would record a movie and he would, my dad would actually edit out certain scenes, but he never <laughs> like, like either Conan or like, Tarzan the Ape Man, he would never he would never edit out any of the violent stuff. So like heads are rolling and Conan, all he would cut out is the nudity <laughs> and then I could watch it. It was just weird. Like he went to all that trouble and it's just like, uh, yeah, we don't want you to see nudity or 
you know, some of it was actually more than just nudity is more sexual, but, um, but yeah, it's like, you know, the, the language, he, I don't, I don't think he cut out any of the language either. Maybe, I don't know, but it was, uh, but definitely none of the violence. So I don't know. It was weird. Yeah. I've always found that really like strange, you know, you're like, how, how is this on TV? But you show like one nipple and it's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's all about context, really, you know, because like there's a lot of debates, too, in the art groups about what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. And it's so hard to, to discern because it all comes down to context. It's not just the nudity itself. It's like, what what is the syntax here? What's going on? What are we supposed to infer from this? You know, but for TV, I mean, I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird thing. I hear it's different over in Europe, though, right? Like they, they're a lot more lenient with nudity and television and movies and everywhere. That's what I. That's my understanding. I mean, I'm sure we can have some people chime in on that that are in Europe, but yeah. As far yeah, as I know, they're walking naked kind of, in the streets. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it's kind of the reverse, actually, where it's like in Europe they're more about like, oh, violence is really bad, but like mm -hmm. nudity is great. Which you know, probably, yeah. which honestly, that is the way it should be. I think <laughs> it's it's hard just because I'm growing up in America, and that's you know it's hard for me to wrap my head around that sometimes. But yeah, that's yeah. probably the way it should be. You know, <laughs> it is it is funny though because growing up in there, it's like I do definitely like if I have to draw something really violent, I don't really think much about it. You know, I'm just like, okay, cool. But if mm -hmm. I have to draw somebody nude, I like usually have a moment of like, am I being tasteful about this? Oh like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. That's fascinating. So, uh, dude. So, uh, I feel like we're getting a little off topic. Yeah, but I, I, at the same time, I was thinking this could be an episode all onto itself. I mean, this might be a good idea for an episode. You know, I was but, actually just gonna connect it back because you were just talking about being self-conscious. That could be fear. Yeah. yeah. Fear. There you go. Mike brings it around. Yeah, see? That's why you have me. <laughs> Captain, bring it around. <laughs> I, it does touch on something I've been trying to work on a little better because it, it, like, in, in the comic I'm writing, one of my main aims is just like total vulnerability like in the storytelling to the point where like I hopefully I'm not making myself out to be a hero. I'm hopefully going to look like a very flawed human being. <laughs> You know, um, and like working through that, like it's, it's it's something I'm also trying to work on on my YouTube channel is being a little more vulnerable and open. Like I, I think um, it hasn't gone up yet, but I think I even just was talking about like a, a book I was reading that was a fiction book. I was like, I realized for some reason I haven't brought that up on my YouTube. Like when I read like a book I really dig that's fiction because it's not art related. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's funny, it's funny, like, moments like that where it's like, have I just been, like, trying to kind of, like, not be vulnerable about, like, certain things? It's, it's interesting trying to kind of be, like, more of an open book, you know? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting exercise because I, I realized I'm, like, way less of an open book than I, than I perceive myself as, you know? I don't so, know. I feel like I'm the opposite. Uh, especially with YouTube, I feel like I get really candid and personal sometimes. I'm, I'm very self-conscious about it because I don't know how people are going to react, you know. But for the most part, I seem to have got a good response. Like, it it's not always right away, but it might even be a year or, or even two now, you know, down the line where someone will make a comment either in their video or send me a message or leave a comment on my video or something like that where they'll point out a, a time when I was vulnerable and how it helped them, you know, yeah. and, and in some cases even encourage them to start doing YouTube videos or to maybe do the 100 Days of Making Comics or something else. And for that reason, it's like, I don't know, I have it in my mind where it's like not something to be afraid of so much anymore. Like it's, I mean, it's still worth being afraid of a little bit because you're, it's, you're being vulnerable, you know, you're being transparent, you're putting this, yourself on the line. But if it has that power to like help somebody, I think we all kind of want to be a little bit more vulnerable sometimes, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's hard. Like our culture doesn't really uh, support that, you know, especially, uh, well, especially like male culture, you know, you're supposed to stiff up your lip and walk it off and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. But, 
<laughs> but uh, but it's helpful. I, I think it can be really helpful because you never know. I mean, I think about myself sometimes when I'm thinking about that uh, that kind of attitude that I'm having about whether I should share something or not. And I think about the position that I was in when I stumbled on 100 Days and watching Kevin's videos and Gaz and everybody else and how they would get personal sometimes, you know, either about the situation or, you know, even even just being honest about how well or not well the comic is going, you know, is valuable to somebody else who might feel like, oh man, everything I do sucks and nothing's coming together and everybody else just gets it right every time. <laughs> but it's like good to know that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, Scott, like how, how do you kind of feel about that like vulnerability on YouTube channels and stuff? I don't know. Um <laughs> What, what, like, what do you mean? Well, like, I don't know. Just for me, it's like, um, I, for some reason, like, like I said, I, I've kind of felt like, like, I'm not a person who, like, tries to hide stuff about myself, right. my personality or something like that. But in the process of, like, writing this, um, there were times where I had to, like, edit my writing, not to, like, hide stuff, but because I was, like, subconsciously, like, trying to make myself look better. Because when, you, right. when yeah. you tell a story from your past, you always give your justifications, you know what I mean? Like, and you always kind of rewrite, at least most people rewrite it to where they're the main character and the hero, you know? Yeah. And uh, so there were parts that I, like, literally had to go back and rewrite and make myself worse. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like I, I'm not that good like I'm not and and also that's not that interesting for somebody to read you know because like no, nobody likes reading like I don't know to me like for auto bio to be really good like the stuff I dig like it, it's fun to read our crumbs of auto bio stuff because it's like it's pervy and weird and funny and crazy yeah. You know? yeah. but if if he like held back on that you know, it wouldn't be any bit interesting, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't do auto bio, so it's a little different, but oh, yeah. I can definitely see where you're coming from. Um, as far as, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm not as open about like certain things. Like I don't usually get into like talk about my kids and stuff online. I don't, you know, that type of thing. I don't really talk much about I mean for me it's almost like a, a persona that I kind of put on. I mean it I hope it comes across as as real and genuine because it is me but it's only like a part of me and part of it's sort of like I, I don't know I, I guess I would liken it to like maybe in some well maybe not as uh, I'm thinking like Seinfeld like he's Jerry Seinfeld in the show but he's not really he's sort of him but he's yeah. not you know mm -hmm. um so, but I, I still, I still like to think that I'm, because I, I, I like to be genuine in everything when I, when I'm talking and the things I talk about, the things I care about, and, um, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff I just don't really put out there. So, so it's a little different. Yeah, I'm, and as far as like what you're talking about, as far as putting yourself, thinking you're putting yourself in too good a light, and then. Um, and then going back and making things worse, or or however you put it, uh, like with my like I have a character. There's a character that's kind of loosely based on me in Young and the Dead. He's like the main character, but I don't want it to come across as uh, as a Mary Sue or anything. And he definitely has, you know, he's not he's not the bravest, and he's not so. There's, but still, it's probably it's in some ways it's more of an idealized version of me, you know, like what you know. I, I don't know how I would behave at that age if there was a zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Probably not as well as that character, but, um, you know, he kind of steps up in some ways, but in other ways he's like, you know. But that's kind of the theme. The, the whole idea of the book is kind of like, not the whole idea, but one of the main things I like is that these are kind of, you know, they're misfit kids, you know, but when this happens, they kind of step up and it's the unlikely ones that, Kind of shine like one of the one of the kids is you know he's kind of a D and D nerd and he knows all about he, and he knows about horror movies and he knows about zombies and stuff like that so 
So he's, whereas before he's kind of like, he's not the popular kid or anything, but now, now that this happens, he's kind of, he can shine because he, he knows just from, you know, from fandom and everything, what to expect. And he, and he, if he trains like, you know, practicing with wooden swords and stuff that it, you know, he's, he's ready to fight zombies. So it's like, whereas, you know, there's a character that's more popular and everything. He's sort of the jock and everything like that, where now his like whole world is gone because that stuff doesn't matter anymore. And he doesn't really know what to do more or less. So, yeah. I think that fits the genre, you know, I think, um, like, you know, I, I, I guess I just, um, for me, it's more of like, kind of like being surprised at the stuff that I've subconsciously like not really talked about on my YouTube, you know, um, which to me was interesting because I, <clears throat> that was like only really recently that, that, that kind of dawned on me. It was like, I need to actually talk to people more about like, everything on YouTube um, for myself because I was just like surprised at what I didn't tell people and I, I think I was kind of assuming they already knew or something which is interesting um, but like I also find like I, I don't know to me I, I think there's also some measure you have to put like some filter like for me I have to filter a lot of what I talk about when it comes to where I work because there's like legal things you know mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. it's like that I have to be really measured about. But outside of that, I'm pretty much able to be like an open book, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know, it's interesting to me, but <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that was heading, sorry guys. <laughs> um, yeah, Mike. Like, I, I think you you are incredibly vulnerable. Like, and not in a negative way, but in a good way. On your YouTube channel, you're very open about like struggles and and oh, yeah. successes and like just kind of like um, your own history and stuff. And it's really mm -hmm. it's really cool. And I think that would like to me. I have had times where I've like you know maybe had a bad day and seen one of your videos and been like, okay, I'm not alone. You know, <laughs> like. Um, <laughs> and like similarly, like you know, like it. I think it. I, I think it makes for really cool content, you know. Yeah. And I think, I think, like once again, I think it, it depends on your aim because I think for Scott, like Scott, I think for you to be authentic, you kind of need to keep the persona on your, on your, on your site because that's kind of, that's kind of the thing. Like it's kind of the the Cirqueworks brand, you know. Right. So, and I think it's authentic to that, yep. you know, in its own way. So it's like, I, I think it's just kind of a different aim, but it's yeah. interesting. <laughs> it's I also think, Scott, you, I think you have a clearer idea of what you're presenting on your YouTube, because I'm still kind of, like, I really, at this point, I have, <laughs> I'm kind of, like I said, I'm kind of throwing everything in the kitchen sink, because I really don't really know. I just kind of like making them, but I, I don't really... I don't know. I need to figure out a better format. I feel like I'm kind of figuring it out, you know. But I think I think doing what you're doing right now in the early stage of your channel is fine. And then as as it grows and as your audience, you start to build an audience. Um, you know, not that you really want them to dictate what you want, but if you can find something that oh, I like doing this and people are responding to it, then maybe you do more of that content or whatever. But in the beginning, maybe just kind of you know trying to figure out, you know, what you want to do. And, um, and you can go back and some of my old videos and some of them were really rough and everything. Some, some of the stuff, I mean, I, I, obviously I wasn't doing the underground layer thing from the beginning, but I mean, I've always had the intro, like, you know, you know, greetings, people of the internet, that type of thing <laughs> since the beginning, but, um, and that's kind of stuck, but I've added things to it, like the robots, alien zombies thing. And, um, you just kind of you kind of go and then you're like, oh, I kind of like that. I'll keep doing that. And then before yeah. you know it, you've kind of got like a sort of a, a structure to it, you know. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I man, I still want to see the like the fully like the 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 entryway to the underground layer. 
I've got, I don't, I've got, I've got a, a like a model of like a, a volcano and then I was going to do a whole intro where you see like, you've got to zoom in through the volcano and then you go in and then, you know, kind of oh, like cool. mystery science theater thing. But you know, I don't, I, I just, I really wanted to do that, but I'm like, I, I even the short intro I have right now before, because yeah. I usually do like a, like a real quick, like, Hey, this is what I'm going to talk about. And then I go just a, a little quick little intro that just says Circworks Art Labs and then it goes in. But right. sometimes I, I even wonder if maybe that's too long because a lot of people, they don't, you know, I just don't know if an intro like that, although it would be really fun if if just the, the nature of YouTube would, you know, like, oh, I've seen this intro, you know, there's no skip intro button on YouTube type of thing, you know, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, if maybe I you just use it as like your channel video, you know, like the intro yeah. on the channel page, even that. Yeah, would... yeah, I could do that. Or, you know, it. I still would like to do it in some way. Like if, if the audience continues to grow and if at some point I want to actually do like an actual show, like, like, I'd still be doing like the the regular like the drawing videos, but if I wanted to do something that was more like a show that had more of a structure to it, yeah. um, and people would know that that's what it is, then maybe do a little intro for that, you know. But right now, you know that that would probably have to be something further if if, if I ever get to the point where, you know, I can support myself just on doing this stuff. Um, yeah. Right now, it would just take too much time to put something like that together. Plus work a full-time job and create oh, yeah. products and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, there's no, as much as that would be fun to do, I just can't. I mean, oh yeah. It's hard no, enough I, to put a video on every week. So <laughs> I just like, I remember when you first mentioned that I was, I was brought back to like how exciting it was to like watch Pee Wee's Playhouse because oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, when I was a kid, like that was, the intro was better than the show. Yeah. Like I wanted to watch the little claymation part. And, and, like, that was the part I didn't want to miss, you know? And it didn't matter how many times they replay it. Now, that was, like, pre-YouTube, so, like, maybe it wouldn't work because people yeah. could keep watching that part on YouTube till they get bored with it, you know? But I, I almost think it would be, like, um, if if you can get to it, I think people would be patient. If yeah. It, it's done the way you're talking about because it, I mean... I've seen your like your sculpts and builds and stuff too. Like, I mean, you're you're really good at fabricating stuff, so I don't doubt it'll look like badass and amazing. <laughs> I like I, mean, I like doing that stuff too, and I, I wouldn't mind doing more of that. Just actually showing how to do it. I used to do this thing called Mad Props, where I'd show how to do certain props and things, but I just haven't done any of that stuff lately. But that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like before, I would do a lot of that, and then for whatever yeah. reason, I'd kind of moved away from that and not, not to say that I wouldn't do that again but um, the main thing I really want to do though is I want to do and it just takes more time but I want to do like art meets science I want to like experiment with different like like materials and techniques and things like that and kind of you know maybe get messy like with just paint splatters and crazy things like just like I don't know I was thinking like oh if I could put maybe if I can put like paint in like a little capsule and shoot it out a nerf gun and then do yeah you know, i don't i was just thinking of because i really want that i want that science angle to be in it i want to do these art experiments so that's something i want to do down the road but it's just the planning and stuff right now i just can't get around to it i want to try to experiment on different mediums yeah. and all that kind of stuff so one of my favorite like sciencey techniques mm -hmm. is you do um you do uh like oil based um well first you spray like your canvas or your illustration board with like water uh -huh. and then you hit it with oil based spray can through spray paint uh -huh. okay yeah so like the oil and water just reject each other and it creates yeah. this nasty weird crazy pattern cool. yeah and you let it dry you just rub off all the extra crap where it wouldn't solidify yeah and then you paint over that, you end up with this like crazy cool texture. I think Froud used that all the time. Cool. And uh, and like <laughs> I, I could just imagine them making a really cool sciencey based one. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. oil and water, two enemies. Yeah, you could you could rock that. Yeah, that's something I definitely want to do. So, but you know, it'll it'll happen at some point. Like if you if you if you ever see my intro, you'll see there's one part where I've got I've got all these colored syringes. Uh -huh. um, 
and it yeah. was just because that's that's something I want to do at some point. Uh, but that wasn't to any actual video. It was just something like, oh, this is the kind of stuff you're going to see, and I haven't done it yet. But eventually I will, you know. I mean, so. No, I mean, that makes sense, too, because, like, you know, part of why my channel right now is what it is is just out of practicality. Like, a lot of my vlogs are on a commute, but that's yeah. just that's what I can swing right now. Right, yeah. Um, ideally, I'd, like, I'd prefer ones where I, like, and specifically talking to the camera, but it's like that window of time is, is yeah. You know? And the yeah. fact that you do, I mean, you, you that you put in that amount of time on your comic book, and you work, you know, a full time job, and you got a family, and all that other stuff. Um, I mean, that's the, but, but the fact that you, well, hey, I'm driving to work. What else am I going to do? It's like just lost time, and you're driving in LA traffic, and it's like. Yeah. So you're taking advantage of it. You're taking some. You're taking something that is like just a basically sort of a waste of time, and yeah. you're you're taking advantage of that. So that's and that's good advice to anyone who you know. I don't have time to do this, or I don't. There's you have time. You just got to figure out, you know, how to make it work. And maybe it's not the prettiest production value. You right. know, maybe the audio is not the best, but you're you're. You're doing something. You're putting something else out there, and you're taking some time that, you know, you, otherwise you're really not doing much. So I mean, yeah, I mean that's that's the perfect thing to do in your situation, Josh. Yeah, I mean I'm you know I'm trying to up the quality, and eventually I'm going to get better equipment and stuff so that the audio will be better and stuff like that. Yeah, and anyone that's starting a YouTube channel, don't don't worry about quality. That will come with time. Just put your stuff out there, you know? Yeah, I mean, my first stuff, like, the first one that I was doing were on this, like, here, I still have it, it on this, which is, like, really gonna show how old I am, but it's, like, this was what I was shooting oh, nice. on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For a webcam right now. Yeah. I'm really similar to I've that. Got, yeah, I've got one. I don't know if I can do this thing here. That's what I'm shooting my, my videos with that, that I've got. Nice. I've got this camera that I shoot. I, this one's a little better, so it works better for the, uh, you know, shooting in the underground layer. And how do you uh, get that thing to like keep there. running? Because I, that's a Canon, right? Is well, that that's a... that's the reason why this ah, this camcorder I just showed you. So that mm -hmm. the camcorder, yeah, the camcorder will run. I can plug that in the wall and it'll run. That's why I use that for my drawing videos and I speed nice. it up. That's why I don't don't you really use this one because it I can't find a thing that plugs into the wall on this. So I just shoot my intro videos with this. Plus it's got a you know, it's got a flip up screen. So oh nice. I can I can see myself in there. So That's rad. You know. Yeah, I have a good like Canon that has yeah. high quality, but it's like I can't it, it literally dies after like twenty minutes. So it's like yeah. Very but different. You don't, you don't need all that stuff. I mean, yeah. I do a lot of stuff with this too. I mean, if you've got one of these, you can do YouTube videos. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yep. Almost everyone has one of these. So. Yeah, and it's a better quality. Like, it, it's funny, but like now, like iPhones and smartphones are like better quality cameras than a lot of the cameras are. Oh, yeah. Because I remember when they first started putting, you know, cameras on phones. Uh, the, I mean, the, 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 Photograph quality was lousy, and people were taking yeah. all these pictures. And I like, I'm like getting mad, and I'm saying that's no no substitute for for a good photo. I mean, you're getting these little, you know, crappy like you know, 72 DPI little tiny JPEGs. You're taking, you're wasting. You know, why are you wasting? So many people were taking pictures then, but now that's not even the case. I mean, these these iPhones will take just as good as pictures as you know, a lot a lot of like, you know. DSLRs and stuff, maybe not that good, but but I mean, you know what I mean. You can, it's HD quality. I mean, it's like now you know, they take all kinds of pictures with that. Whereas before, it was, it was like, don't do that. Yes, indeed. So, like, we're, Mike, were we were we going to talk about the one hundreds, or should we? I just I don't know. I'm trying. I was trying to think of a way to like tie that in. Uh, well, I mean, I, I would give a teaser, and then either we can have Mike back on, or I don't know. I'd like to get Marshall on. The only problem is that his schedule, like yeah, maybe some sometime not. we what? His schedule is so nuts. 
But yeah. uh, if you did an earlier show, like 4 p.m. or something, you might. Yeah, to it's a, that's hard for us. But I, I'm wondering if maybe I assume he has weekends off. Maybe we could do a Friday show sometime. Or yeah. we could pre-record all of his parts, and I could just play it on like VLC yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> get him to but, say like, "Yeah, that's right." Or just we can't get Marshall. We'll have you on again, and you know. Yeah. Have him Is record it? stingers, and you can just be like, you'll just be like, oh yeah, <laughs> when you press a button. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be down for that too. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess we could talk about it a little bit if you want. Um, I would at least tease it and let people know it's coming up, and then you know we can go into it more. We'll have you or Marshall back on later. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, well, I well, thought it would tie into the fear thing a little bit because I mean that's a massive project, so I'm sure there were yeah. some times of anxiety while building this thing. You know? <laughs> so much, yeah. I think for all of us too, because actually, uh, a lot of people that were involved, this is their first comic, like well, at least their first comic that's actually been printed in a book and that's going to be sold to people. You know, myself included. So there is a lot of fear going into it. Um, so, okay, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, um, The 100 Days of Making Comics, uh, created by Kevin Cross, everybody I'm sure is familiar with that by now, um, we all just decided one day uh, to do an anthology. It was, uh, it was actually Chris McQuinlan's idea at first, and then uh, he and Marsh and I started kind of uh, uh, colluding. We, we came up with a little plan, and we pitched it to everybody. We decided on a theme, which ended up becoming Life in Space, and I'm I'm holding the book right now. Actually, like we we didn't just uh, think about this idea. We actually made this happen. It's the actual book, it's just the proof copy right now. But um, but we got it printed. It's it's done. Kevin Cross did the cover, and it's super super sweet. And we got 20 creators involved in this total. I think we got 14 stories and a bunch of pinups. Uh, Scott's in it. Gaz is in it. Um, I'm in it, Marsh, Chris, uh, JL and Rats, Jan, uh, Noah, I mean, just about anybody that you've ever heard of doing the hundreds, especially that's been on this show. Um, we're all involved in this book in some way. And we're not launching the Kickstarter quite yet, but it's coming up in January for sure. Um, we, we're not going to give you a definite date right now because we're still figuring out exactly when we want to launch, but it's definitely going to be in January. And um, as long as I'm plugging, if you if you want to keep up with it, just write down uh, 100, as in 100, 100 days of making comics.com. And that's going to link to the Kickstarter when we actually finally launch it. Um, and that's some big news too, actually, for the hundreds. Like we've been hardcore trying to uh, to do some awesome stuff for this group. So we actually bought the .com, the .org, the .net, all of them. We we all pooled together to buy the domains to actually get a website finally. So um, for now, it's going to point to the Kickstarter, but then after that, we're going to have a legit hundreds website. So yeah, look forward to that. Awesome! Huzzah! Yeah, that's that's all I got too. <laughs> That is super rad. It looks really good too. The proof just looks excellent. So, I, mm -hmm. that's a book I'll be uh, getting. So, hopefully, awesome. anybody watching, um, I'm sure almost everybody's familiar with it, but anybody yeah. who's not, definitely, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, super, super proud of that. I mean, that, that really plays into the fear category that we were talking about as well, because, you know, we had to pull a lot of people together to make this happen you don't know who's gonna follow through who's not gonna follow through and it ended up that like 90 percent of everyone that committed stayed the course and finished all the way through the end i mean the only people that dropped out dropped out because you know life happens sometimes things happen and you know uh, and that's just that but i mean it was just amazing how well everything came together and uh <laughs> I've got a little bit of fear about the Kickstarter coming up, but I'm hoping that we do all right. <laughs> I, I think I think it'll do fine. Just because when you have all those creators, they've all got their own fans, they all have their own people, and yeah. they're all going to be out promoting it. And so I think it I think it'll do well. Yeah, I hope so. So many people put a lot of work into this book. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I, I think it's amazing you guys organized it because I. I I have a few friends who've done anthologies and when you guys were initially talking about it I think we had I think it was like right when I first started on Hardcasters mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about it and I think 
that was one of my biggest questions at the time was just like, are you guys ready for that? Because <laughs> it's a yeah. massive like undertaking to edit. Um, yeah, it really is. Like, to, to gather and pool resources and to get people to hit deadlines and like, oh, yeah. because <laughs> everybody's got their thing, you know? And, yeah. uh, and like, I, I've, n I've never heard of an anthology that was started out and every contributor mm -hmm. did it, you know? Yeah, like, yeah that, we were pretty lucky that, in that respect, you know? That, yeah, people that stay percentage, on. that percentage is insanely good, Yeah. You know? Yeah, and the few people that dropped out actually dropped out really early. Like they they already knew that they weren't going to be able to uh, to keep up with it, and so they got out before it even began. We didn't have anybody drop out like midway through the book, which I thought that's just incredible. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. But uh, yeah, we're. I mean, it's really been a big group effort too. Like from, and I think that's kind of partly why it was successful. It wasn't like we had a small management team that sort of kept everything together. But anytime there was a big decision to make, we would do polls in uh, in a Facebook group and ask everybody's opinion. You know, what do you, what does everyone think about this scenario? You know, and then from that we had like kind of the council of elders sort of situation to kind of decide. Okay, well, what's best? You know, this is what everybody wants can we do this how can we do this that kind of thing all the way up until right now like right now we've got a, a good chunk of people that are all working on all the promotional materials so like no single person is working on everything it's, it's all a huge group effort really awesome that's amazing yeah that's a great way to overcome fear actually if we want a, a nice moral to this story is like do it with friends. Don't do it by yourself. You know, that's a, that's another great reason I think to be vulnerable on YouTube, put yourself out there, all that kind of stuff. Cause when you start interacting with more people, it normalizes it. You start learning that, Hey, this isn't so bad. Other people have gone through it too, or they can support you or, or have your back in some way. It's a great way to conquer fear. Don't do it alone. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's true. I mean, so should we just touch on some little methods to conquer fear and then and then wrap it up? <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. So I think we mentioned the one at the the, at the beginning, which is just the question. Just ask yourself rational questions, because like um, I think when you're feeling anything kind of mental at all, you you always have to like kind of counterbalance with like, of course, it's real, like what you're experiencing. But is it real? Like, is is it reality based? You know. So, like, questions like, um, like, where? What's the worst case scenario? Where does that lead mm -hmm. compared to where I am now? You know. Um, and is it that bad? You know, <laughs> like, right? Um, and then where does it stack up compared to, say, like an earthquake or like breaking your legs or like something horrible, horrible? You know. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, art fears are not going to be on. the uh, even the same level of like having to get the alignment done on your car, you know, <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> so it's like, you know, there's bigger things out there to fear, but that's a good way to start because when you're in the thick of it and your, your head is kind of telling you like reasons for failure or reasons to stall, you know, usually that's a good way to stop it pretty short. And then I think um, you were just bringing up another one, which is community, right? Oh yeah. And that's massive. So rely on community, um, go to drink and draws, like don't be an artist just stuck in your room that doesn't talk to other artists because you'll go nuts. Definitely. Especially like if you're freelance, like you've got to know at least somebody online or somebody who's freelancing because clients are going to drive you nuts sometimes and you'll try to talk to people who aren't artists about it and they'll, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, only other artists are the type of people you can say something like, make it pop and anybody who's an artist knows how irritating <laughs> that is, you know, but anybody yeah. who's not an artist is like, make it pop. <laughs> you know, like, what's wrong with that? You just make it pop. Um, so it's like, you know, for venting for like that kind of thing, that's good. Um, what, what else do, what else do you think would help just kind of tackle fears, you know, as an artist, especially like with selling your work since you just overcame that Mike. Yeah. Oh man, I'd say just do it. I, I know that sounds really corny and maybe even too simple, but that was the ultimate solution was to just do it. Because everything that I was afraid of, I, I wasn't going to get answers to until I actually tried it. And yeah. any of the 
the multiple questions I had about what if, what if, what if, what if couldn't be answered until I, I did it. And then, and then it wasn't so bad. And even in past situations in my life where I've been very fearful of like starting a, a new job or a, or a big thing, uh, just diving in has been the, the best way to get over that fear. Cause uh, kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, like it normalizes it eventually. Like it's, it sucks at first that like not everything is going to be like, Oh, this wasn't so bad. It's going to be like, yep, this is exactly as bad as I thought it was or worse, you know, but we have this, all humans have this in, insane ability to adapt over time. And like, if you just relax and remind yourself of kind of like what you were saying, Josh, about it's, it's not death, you know, like it's, you're not going to like be crushed by the earth's gravity or something. If you draw a bad picture or take a job that isn't as good as you thought it would be or something like that. But, you know, working through it, it tends to get better and, and easier and you tend to be able to grow from those kinds of experiences too. So. Yeah. I think another thing that might help is just draw from your experiences because I think, I think most people have done something like this before, like you said, Mike, whether it's you start a new job and you're nervous, but it all works out. I mean, look look in the past because you maybe you've launched something before. And it, it's weird because it doesn't matter if you've launched something three times or 300 times. A lot of times you're still like, oh, I don't know, should I launch this next thing? But look, look at what you've done before. It's like it either turned out well last time or chances are it didn't turn out horribly. Maybe it didn't go great or whatever, but it didn't turn out horribly. Maybe it was worth trying. So just know that. I mean, know from what you've done in the past that, yeah, you know, I've done this before. I can do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend who, um, who's a writer and submitted a lot before ever getting published to publishers and had collected like over like 50 rejection letters. And, uh, for the for those of you who've like submitted to publishers, like that's actually a pretty low quantity <laughs> for rejection letters. And the fact that she got even got rejection letters. Oh like, yeah, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, but um, she would frame them. So she had like she I think to this day still has a, a like room in her house that's just like all rejection letters, like just lining the walls. Um, but. I, I actually think that's a good practice. So like, I don't frame my rejection letters, but I, but I do have a pile, you know, and, uh, and I like to keep them because actually anytime I have like a fear of that, it's, it's nice to look back and be like, well, I've received them before. Did it like screw up my life? No, it was just kind of sucked for the moment. And then you just kind of get over it and move on and you learn things. So like, that's the other thing too, is just remembering that like, um, when you face those fears, like if the worst case scenario happens, you're going to learn a lot more about it than, than you would in the hypothetical. Oh yeah, you know? definitely. So, like for instance, like let's say your store just peters out. Nobody buys anything. Like you've learned so much from setting up the store, putting it up from shipping and receiving the stuff that did sell. Yep. And if it, and if it bombs, then it's like from there you can launch a more successful thing or regroup and find a different strategy. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But you can't know what to regroup about or what strategies would be better or worse without trying. So, yeah. and then like the last thing I'll say is less encouraging, which is like um, kind of the case of the other fear that we were talking about that you you were talking about when with gaming, right? With game design, mm -hmm. where it's like sometimes, um, sometimes also just don't. <laughs> like either do or don't, you know? Um, but at some point it has to come to where you pull the trigger or you just like put it away and, and accept it. And if you can't put it away and accept it, then that's probably a good sign that you should pull the trigger, you know? Yeah. Cause I think like most of the people in the hundreds, like probably would have dropped comics if it were about financial or whatever, if it were like a choice, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think most of us just do comics. Like that's what we want to do. We're going to do it yeah. like, regardless. And so it's like at that point you really have to pull, like if you're one of those people and you're lingering on doing a comic or setting up an art store or whatever, it's like at some point you got to just either do it or abandon it and be comfortable with abandoning it. And if you can't be comfortable abandoning it, then do it. You just have yeah. to do it. Yeah. In, in honor of Star Wars coming out tomorrow, I just quote Yoda and say, "Do or do not. There is no try." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
There you All go. Right. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's end it on Yoda. All right. Um, uh, so one last time, Mike, where can people find your work? Where can they, you know, support the hundreds when it comes out? Yeah. Okay. So uh, for me and all my stuff, the best way to remember is just spacecatcomics.com. That'll go straight to my store right now, but there's a little link bar on the bottom that links you to everything else that I do too, like my Instagram, my Facebook, my YouTube, and all that kind of stuff. So spacecatcomics.com. I'll get a website eventually. Uh, for the hundreds, a uh, similar situation, go to 100 days of comics.com. That's 100 with a one, a zero, and a zero. Days of comics.com. I got a landing page set up that has, you know, just our, our banner and a little bit, a little blurb about the anthology right now. And then once we launch, that link will actually point directly to the Kickstarter. And then after the Kickstarter, that link will point directly to the 100 Days of Making Comics webpage. So no matter how you slice it, 100 Days of Making Comics.com will be a link that you will want to use in the future. Awesome. <laughs> that was Perfect. that for a pitch. All right. And it'll uh, clean your car and it tastes like chocolate. I don't know. It slices, it dices. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. You can check out my stuff here, uh, obviously, and uh, go to quarterlystories.com. And if you want to do me a massive favor, uh, check out uh, Quarterly Stories on Tapas. Um, I'm trying to kind of post pretty much every Wednesday, so like right before our casters can read your daily page of quarterly stories, my depressing graphic novel. And then, um, uh, Scott, where can we find your stuff and where can the people sign up for our newsletter? <laughs> yeah, so you can find me down here at uh, cirqueworks.com. Also, I got a new site, uh, Cirque Pop. Dot com and I've got some pop culture t-shirts on there. Um, but the, yeah, if you go to Cirqueworks, or there's a store on there. Uh, I've got tons of stuff. I don't, I think, maybe if you order like, as this posting, you might get it by Christmas. Um, but I, I don't know if I can guarantee it at this point. I think so, but anyway, but it, or or maybe it might be a little late. But anyway, I got I still have a bunch of stuff on there. If anyone wants to check any of that stuff out, Mad Science Supplies at cirqueworks.com or Pop Culture Designs at cirquepop.com. And as far as this, uh, the way we do this, we do this every week, more or less. Uh, maybe we might skip a few days of the, with Christmas coming up, but more or less, we do this every week, usually on Wednesday, but not always. So, and you may be saying to yourself, well, um, it's on Josh's channel, but I've seen it on Scott's channel too. Yeah, we just kind of flip back and forth. So if you want to know where we are, the easiest way to do that, what time we're going to be, what channel we're going to be on, all that, because it's not same bat time, same bat channel. Um, but one way you can find out is to join our mailing list, and we don't spam anyone or anything. We just uh, we just usually send out a little notification about 30 minutes beforehand and let you know uh, when we're going to be broadcasting and where, and we'll send you a nice link there. And uh, yeah, and in order to do that, there is a link in the uh, sh in the um, description of this video. So just click that link if you haven't already and join the uh, mailing list. All right. So, uh, yeah, and as Christmas is coming up, make sure you guys act fast and buy a bunch of prints from all three of us. <laughs> right. uh, we will right. see you guys next week. All right. Maybe. Later, everyone. <laughs> Good night.